Jungles and Open Doors. Welcome as we take another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She called us to live to a higher standard, to not be satisfied with just a little empty religion. As our series continues, we'll hear from family, friends, and others. They were all influenced by the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. Hey, whether it's your first time or you've been with us many times before, it's good to have you with us today. Today we wrap up a five-part series on Jungle Diaries, but also hearing about a 1996 trip that now brought an adult Valerie and her husband Walt, and even one of their sons. So stay with us. We'll be hearing part of the memorial service as we think back to what happened in Ecuador. This was on January 15th, a week or so after the five missionaries were killed in 1956. And we'll hear from a veteran missionary, Frank Kohlinger, as he thinks about the legacy of those five missionaries. Well, let's wrap up our series on Jungle Diaries as we're aboard a freighter today. And uh, Elizabeth is thinking about how she needs to write 50,000 words, but writer's block has set in. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, continuing today with brief excerpts from some old jungle diaries that I dredged up out of the trunk in the attic, diaries that I hadn't read. I don't think I'd read them since they were written. The next entry that I'll give you was from August 27, 1960, written aboard the SS Santa Cecilia, somewhere east of Georgia. This was a freighter, a beautiful Graceline ship, which I had boarded in New York for Ecuador, and it took about 10 days to get to Ecuador. I had been in the States at the request of Harper and Row publishers, who had seen the pictures that I had taken of the Alcas and wanted me to come and write what I thought was just going to be a book of pictures with captions. I was supposed to do the caption writing. But when I got to the States, I discovered that they expected me to write 50,000 words, And that eventually turned into the book which is called The Savage, My Kinsman. During that time in the States, I worked with the usual difficulties. Staring into space, chewing a pencil, shuffling papers, wondering whatever gave me the idea that I could write a book. It's still like that. I've written a few more books since then, and it's always hard work. People who aspire to be writers often imagine that it's recreation. Maybe it is for some of them, but not for me. And the Lord was saying to me, take my yoke upon you and learn. Learn of me. That's what God is up to in every situation, every day of our lives. We're to take his gentle yoke and learn from him because he is gentle and humble in heart. And I don't think very many of us come that way. It's not natural, is it? George MacDonald said, If I mistake, he will forgive me. I do not fear him. I fear only lest, able to see and write these things, I should fail of witnessing and myself be, after all, a castaway, not a king, but a talker not a disciple of Jesus ready to go with him to death, but an arguer about the truth. If you want to know what to pray for me, and I'm speaking to you radio listeners, please pray that I will not be a castaway by failing to witness. Pray that the Lord will not allow me to be merely a talker, but a doer of the things that I talk about. I'll go on with the diary. Left New York yesterday afternoon. Mother, Dad, Tom, and Jim saw me off. Jim is my youngest brother. Sailing a calm, warm sea. The captain's dinner tonight. As I was leaving the dining room, 
He was playing with Valerie and somehow managed to stop me and eventually had me seated at his table. Conversation ensued. He revealed that he and 23 other Grace Line captains had each gotten their crews to contribute $500 toward the work of the five men who had been killed in Ecuador in 1956. When I landed in Ecuador, I felt reluctant to return to the Alcas. I spent a week wondering if I should go back there or return to the Quechua Indians. I should tell those who haven't kept up with the story that I had worked with two other Indian tribes, the Colorados and the Quechuas, before I went to the Alcas, who were the Indians who had killed five American missionaries in 1956. And the Lord had opened a way for me to go and live with them, so I had spent a year with them before this diary entry had been I had been a year in the States working on a book and finally made the decision to go back to Tijuana, which was the place where I had lived for that first year with the Alcas themselves. And this is a September 25th, 1960 entry. So I am here asking God to accept what I do from cleaning the cricket dirt out of all the things I left here to trying to love and be patient with the Indians and have mercy on me in this deadly dryness. I can hardly even pray for spiritual freshness or anything. I simply lift up my hands unto thee. More than usually bothered by smoke in my eyes, chickens, dogs, cats, monkeys, and assorted tamed birds in my food and on my, quote, dining table, unquote, which was a slab of bamboo, and the trivial talk which continues day and night on three sides of my house. I accept these conditions as appointed for the present and thank God for them simply because they are part of this place to which he must have brought me. At present, I feel nothing of bearing these things for his sake or enduring hardness as a good soldier. I just read Fierce the Conflict, the story of Lillian Hamer of the Lisu in Thailand felt awed and shamed by the hardships she endured for Christ with a deep sense of enduring them for him and for a very tangible purpose. My purpose seems quite intangible, and indeed grave doubts sometimes beset me as to whether my actions spring not purely, but even in the smallest degree, from love for Christ. Again the word which has arrested me so often— Though I give my body to be burned and have not love, I am nothing. I was thinking much about what it meant for Jesus to leave his home. One of my favorite hymns when I was a child, and I'm not reading from the diary anymore, this is just commentary. One of my favorite hymns was Out of the Ivory Palaces into a World of Woe. That both the words and the music of that lovely hymn were written by Henry Barraclough, who was the organist of the church that my dear friend Essie had attended. Essie and I were both nine years old when Essie died, and Henry Barraclough played beautifully on the organ that lovely hymn, Out of the Ivory Palaces into a World of Woe. Only his great eternal love made my Savior go. Jesus chose a particular time, place, and culture and fitted into it inconspicuously in some ways. But he demonstrated by all that he said, all that he did, the life of God. Yet he was one with us, concerned with our feelings, hopes, and sufferings, conscious of whatever we are conscious of. He loved us. Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 17, give us a glimpse into just what Jesus did. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. That's you and me. 
For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let me read that last verse again. It's Hebrews 2.18. Because he himself, that's Jesus, suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And in chapter 5, verses 7 to 9 of the same book of Hebrews, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The source of of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus identified himself completely with us. He took upon himself the chains of humanity, the limitations, the sorrows, the sufferings, the difficulties, the weaknesses. Do we have problems identifying with people that God wants us to identify with? Well, I had plenty of problems of being semi-identified, Here we had a radio, for example. Certainly wasn't a cultural item. And the monkeys removed the clip from the radio aerial. The Indians' pet birds walked over the clean new pages of Valerie's home school books. I found my washcloth in my soup one time and a snake on the floor. So there were always strange mixes of civilized items with what normally goes on in a very primitive place. I had written in my journal, if I lived in a halfway civilized house, I could have, number one, kept the monkey out, number two, shut out the birds, number three, had some privacy. The only other solution is complete identification, which means living exactly as do the alcas, which would mean that I would not need number one, a radio, number two, to educate Val. And I find myself counting heavily on building a small, walled, and screened bamboo house when Rachel gets back, if I can do so without hindering the work. Lord, you know what is best, and I'll thank you for it. Excerpts from journals of when I was living with the Alca Indians of eastern Ecuador back in 1958 to 1960. Part 5, the conclusion of our short series, Jungle Diaries, Back to America. Later on, we'll begin another short series related to Ecuador. But first, though, we go back to the memorial service in Quito, Ecuador. This was on January 15, 1956, a week or so after the five missionaries were killed in Operation Alca. With their very limited time to uh, think about what had happened, what was the immediate reaction? Greetings, radio friends, round the round world. The back home hour tonight will be a memorial service to the five missionary martyrs who gave their lives for Christ and his gospel just one week ago, seeking to reach the savage Auca Indians in the jungles of Ecuador. Out of this apparent tragedy is coming a wonderful note of victory. On the shores of that little river that few of us have ever seen, there has been left the remains of this small missionary aviation plane. Nearby, the common grave in which our fallen comrades have been buried. No greater monument could ever be erected by any government or any group of men than the simple testimony that that plane, stripped of its fabric and yet still standing there, shall give as long as it lasts. 
and as long as that river flows. To try to evaluate what these men have done in human terms is indeed difficult. To think of this martyrdom of five valiant men on a material basis is indeed absurd. Even to put this sacrifice of supreme devotion on the level of altruism or humanitarianism simply doesn't satisfy our hearts. There must be something higher, something more noble, something more glorious, and indeed there is, as you've already heard mentioned previously. There is only one right and satisfying explanation for what happened out there in Operation Auka just one week ago. It is on the high spiritual elevation of love of Christ and of his gospel more than the love of self. In this is the lesson that shall be ours and the world long as the names of these five men shall live in our memory. The memorial service from Quito, Ecuador, January 15th, 1956. Later on, we'll be hearing from veteran missionary Frank Kohlinger as he thinks about the legacy of those five missionaries who died. But first, a trip to Ecuador. Now, we've been thinking about Jungle Diaries, Move ahead to 1996 in your mind. A Trip to Ecuador, Part 1. God Opens Doors. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot. As some of our listeners know, I was a missionary in Ecuador between 1952 and 1963. And so I had many friends in three different tribes of Indians, three different tribes that I worked with doing linguistic work, reducing their languages to writing, etc. Well, we decided that since we hadn't seen all the people we wanted to see, we would try it again. And so we went in January of 1996, and we took along my daughter Valerie and her husband Walt. Walt, incidentally, grew up in Africa. His parents were missionaries over there. So Valerie and Walter have quite a bit in common, having lived in the jungle, having spoken those very strange sounding languages, and they both loved that life. So we also took their oldest son, who was 18 years old. He had been visiting his great uncle, Bert Elliott, Jim Elliott's older brother who has been a missionary in Peru for more than 45 years. And Walter decided to go down there. This is Walter the third now, my oldest grandson, who decided to go down and spend some time with his Uncle Bert, learning Spanish, teaching English as a second language, and doing whatever help he could give, helping in different ways, such as construction of a school building, and anything that his uncle might want to tell him. But the main purpose of his going there was to just be under the tutelage of a very godly man. Lots of people have heard of Jim Elliot. Very few people know about Bert Elliot, but he is one of those hidden ones, a godly man with a very godly wife who has been unsung. I think of him as a hero. And a fellow missionary told me years ago, I'm going to tell you something, Elizabeth, that you're, that you're never going to learn from your brother-in-law. But he said, it's the truth. Your brother-in-law has founded about 45 churches in Peru. Small churches in remote areas of the jungle and in very remote areas of the high Andes. So six months out of the year, he used to travel by launch and reach the jungle people. And six months out of the year, he traveled by camper up in the high Andes. So it was a sacrificial life. And we were very thankful that Walter was willing and eager to go down there and spend time with him in order also to seek God's direction for his life. So Walter took a bus up to Quito and met us there. But before I get you to Quito, I do want to tell you of the wonderful way in which the Lord opened door after door after door. This was a trip 
that was not easy to plan. It was quite impossible to work out a firm itinerary because one never knows whether it's going to be possible to get to the jungle because of weather and because of roads that often have landslides and because of various methods of transportation, not all of which work all the time. And another thing was corresponding with my Indian friends to let them know that we would be coming down and hoping that they would be able to sort of collect from different areas of the jungle the people that we were wanting to see. But the first area in which we really had to trust God was getting just from our home in Magnolia, Massachusetts, to Logan Airport, the Boston Airport. The day before, we had heard the predictions of a huge snowstorm that was coming in. And so Lars had tried to get us an earlier flight, knowing that as the day wore on, that it would be more and more likely that the airport would be closed. Well, the air, the earlier flight was booked. But we had a friend coming to take us to the airport, and she had a very, very difficult time getting to our house. It was, in fact, a whiteout, and she had her 10-year-old son with her in the car, and he was watching the breakdown lane of the highway, and she was watching the guardrail in the center, and she said she could see virtually nothing in front of her. Well, the Lord guided them, protected them. They got to our house. We got into the car, and all the time I was thinking this is an exercise in futility. We're never going to get to the airport, or if we get to the airport, it's going to be closed, or at least our flight will be canceled. We got to the airport. Almost every other flight was canceled. Ours was not. We were to fly to Miami. Then we discovered that we were on standby for the next flight, which was supposed to leave at something like 8.30. And I thought, well, Lord, undoubtedly it's full, being as pessimistic as I am by nature. But I said, Lord, it's all in your hands. And I had been saying this for months. Every time I thought of the trip to Ecuador, I just said, Lord, I'm trusting you. I am going to trust you. I am not going to worry about this. You know how to engineer everything according to your will. Well, although we were on standby, we got a seat on the plane. We met Valerie and Walter in Miami. We flew to Quito, and their son, Walter, who had come up from Peru in a bus, was waiting for us at the airport. And that was a thrill. The next question was, how were we going to get to the jungle? We found out that the one road that I knew about that goes from Quito down into the eastern jungle, a road built by the Shell Oil Company back in the late 30s, was closed because of landslides. I didn't think there was any other road, but then I found out that since my day, way back in 1963, what used to be a mule trail has now been made into a road. Many oil companies are now drilling in Ecuador, and they've made some very tremendous, dramatic changes. But what kind of transportation would we find? Were there buses? Were there taxis? Were there... We didn't know what there were. And the very next day, who should appear in front of the guest house where we were staying in Quito but Steve Saint, son of missionary pilot Nate Saint of Operation Alka. Many of you know the story of five missionaries who were killed in 1956 in Ecuador. One of them was my husband, Jim Elliott. Another one, the one who had really uh, had the vision for reaching the Alka Indians, was Nate Saint, missionary aviation pilot. And his son, Steve, is now also a missionary and a pilot. And there was Steve with his wife and his teenage son and daughter standing there in front of the guest house as we came across the street. We greeted each other. We hugged each other. He calls me Aunt Betty. And he said, well, what are you all going to do? Well, we said, we're hoping to get down to Shelmeta, to the jungle tomorrow. And he said, how are you going to get there? Well, we don't know, we said. And he said, well, we're going tomorrow. Why don't we go together? And so that's what happened. He borrowed a van. He drove all five of us, plus his family. And we got to a little town called Tana, 
which is not very far from the station called Shandia, in which my husband Jim and I had worked. Well, Tana was nothing but a crossroads when I lived there in that area, and so I expected that when we got to Tana, because it's such a small town, we would be able to find Venancio, a Quechua Indian, a very godly man, the man who took over the pastoring of the church when Jim was killed, and he was also the teacher in our little school, sixth grade school. And Venancio is a very dear friend and a very faithful, godly man. So I'd been corresponding with him for six months, hoping that he would be able to help us arrange our trip to the jungle and meet the people that we wanted to see. Well, I was amazed when we got to Tana to find out that it was no longer just a crossroads. It was a metropolis. So the great question was, how are we going to find Venancio? I didn't know where Paushiyaku was. That's the address he gave me. I found out that Paushiyaku was sort of a part of Tana, but it was a very big place. What could we do? Well, we stopped at the first little restaurant that looked as though it might be a promising place to find somebody. And we hadn't even gone into the restaurant when a young Quechua man, I would guess to be maybe 20, 22, came up and said, Buenos dias. Well, I said to him, Arunashimera Rimak Changi, which is not Spanish, that's Quechua. And he almost had a heart attack right there on the sidewalk. Here's this tall, old, gray-haired foreigner speaking Quechua to him. He broke into a big smile. Yes, indeed, he did speak Quechua, and we carried on a conversation. I found out that he was the son of a Christian man whom I had known years before, and he also knew Venancio. You know where Venancio lives, I said. Venancio was here at Ixingichu? Adi, he said, yes. Shinakpi Pushapangi. And he said, Adi. I said, please take us there. And so he got into the van with us and told us where to go. It wasn't more than about a quarter of a mile. My heart was just pounding, thinking, imagine how faithfully our loving shepherd has guided us point after point, from point to point, and in all sorts of uncertainties and vicissitudes. Do you know the hymn, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us? Much we need thy tender care. Well, he is a faithful shepherd. He leads us, the Bible tells us, in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And when he leads us in a path that we didn't expect, let's remember it's for his name's sake. That was the first in a five-part series called A Trip to Ecuador, God Opens Doors. Well, before we go, let's hear from missionary Frank Kohlinger. Tell us a little bit about the legacy of uh, the five missionaries and Elizabeth and Rachel Saint. Uh, how has uh, their ministry and their sacrifice affected the uh, Alka, the Walrani people? It has borne fruit, obviously, because there are there are several uh, Alka people who are sincerely saved and wanting to live for the Lord. Now, at this conference that I attended in 2006, uh, we got word from some of the older Alkas who were around when the men were killed that they're faithful, but they're concerned about the younger generation who they put into their language. They're not walking God's trail uh, like we did or we are doing. So they're concerned about the younger generation. Not really too different than any of us here in the United States wondering about the younger generation, our own children, grandchildren, etc. There are some you know, good believers among them. As, as I noticed throughout the jungle, there's a many among Quechua's and even the, the other uh, Shuar and not Shuar language groups, which is to the south. That's where Raja Udarian uh, was ministering. And um, in all of these areas, there are groups of believers meeting together, uh, faithful to the Lord. And, uh, and all, I say the, the various groups are local churches among them, and all sizes and shapes of spiritual maturity. So, uh, but at least they do have the gospel and 
most of these places are on their own now because there's no foreign missionaries in these places. Missionary Frank Kohlinger. Well, our time is quickly coming to an end. Thanks for letting us come into your home, your office. Maybe along with you as you're driving or jogging, wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. More lectures, devotionals, videos, and more. It's elizabethelliot.org. And if you get a chance, leave a review for us wherever you uh, have been listening to this program. And we thank you for taking time for that. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>